Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's event. Web seminars are enhanced by your participation, so we encourage you to submit your questions throughout the presentation. Please use the Ask a Question button at any time throughout today's presentation. You may type in your questions here. All answers will be given verbally. If you experience any audio issues during the webcast, please click on the Rate This button on the top of your player window and follow the instructions to receive help. If this does not resolve the issue, please email support at brighttalk.com and a customer support specialist will get back to you shortly. This event will be available on demand just a few minutes after the live event concludes. We invite you to view other upcoming events and other on-demand content available in this channel after the presentation. Today's speaker is Bradley Duncan. Bradley is a threat intelligence analyst with Palo Alto Network's Unit 42 research team. Welcome, Bradley. Uh, thank you guys for having me here at this webinar. Um, I'm uh, very excited today to present some of the uh, uh, research I've been a part of, uh, uh, both through Unit 42 and uh, some of my other uh, uh, outlets that I release information at, uh, whether it's my web blog or the uh, ISC Handler's Diary or through my Twitter feed. Today, we're going to look at the combined threat of ransomware and uh, uh, exploit kits. We're going to look at why state, local governments, and education, which we call the SLED vertical, um, organizations within the SLED vertical, why they are particularly susceptible. We're going to look at how exploit kits work. We're going to look at ransomware history and trends. And finally, we'll wrap up with what should be your best defense against this particular threat. As we all know, ransomware is a term for malicious software that holds your computer or files on your computer for ransom. It's a very popular news story nowadays. Exploit kit. An exploit kit is a method of malware distribution that takes advantage of vulnerabilities in browser-based applications to infect a computer behind the scenes. If you're to ask why exploit kits delivering ransomware are a particularly nasty combination, the answer is you can get infected with ransomware just through casual web browsing, just through normal day-to-day -day activities as long as you're browsing the web. Next up, we look at why the SLED vertical is particularly susceptible. The biggest issue with uh, state, local governments, and education is budget, especially for public schools and the state, county, and city agencies. doesn't allow as many resources for cyber defense that you see in the uh, uh, federal level of our government and the commercial sector. Uh, um, businesses, uh, uh, large businesses especially, generally have a lot more resources dedicated for cyber defense. The educational mindset within a lot of schools is more open. It, facil it facilitates data sharing and academic collaboration, but unfortunately, the flip side is it makes it easier for criminals to get into your networks. There are other unique challenges depending on your particular environment. What I will say is earlier this week, I looked at, uh, um, I got a phishing email. Um, Looking at the email headers, it came from MIT, the, Mass the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. This is a server that they were running that somehow got taken over and was being used behind the scenes to distribute a PayPal fish that led to a fake PayPal website. So this is not specifically exploit kit related, but that is an educational institution that was compromised. Now the criminals could have put ransomware on that uh, uh, on that server, but they did not. They decided to use it for phishing purposes. Next up, we're going to look at how exploit kits work. Now, there are two main methods to distribute malware that criminals use. 
The first method requires some sort of user action, malicious spam or pop-up windows during web browsing. Here is an example of an email earlier this month. It happened on October 5th. It has a zip file attachment. It's disguised as a uh, um, as a cancellation form. If you were to open up that zip file and double click on the file inside, it would download ransomware to your machine. It would execute it behind the scenes, and next thing you know, you've got the windows popping up saying your files are encrypted. This one, I believe, is malicious spam for locky ransomware. Another type is pop-up windows during web browsing. For example, if you were to go to a particular website, that website uh, you might not even get there. You'll just be directed to another page that pops up a window. In this case, it's a fake flash updater. This fake flash updater is not really a flash updater. It will install some sort of malware on your computer or an unwanted program that you did not want thinking that you were installing a flash update. With this particular category, you often have plenty of warning that you're doing something wrong. Uh, you will get notifications that this type of file will harm your computer or that the file could not be verified, and you will have to uh, uh, click, past, click past a warning that tells you the computer is um, that, that you have a bad file. But the second method, another method happens behind the scenes without the user's knowledge. This is how, this is a preferred method for a lot of criminals is to somehow sneak by and infect your computer while you're doing your normal day-to-day -day tasks. And this is the method used by exploit kits. Exploit kits work by taking a criminal's ransomware and infecting a user's computer behind the scenes. Exploit kits typically distribute malware targeting systems running Microsoft Windows. Uh, it's not to say if you have an iPhone or you're working on a MacBook or you have an Android phone that they couldn't get infected through some other method with some with some other type of malware, and there are examples of ransomware for MacBook and Android phones. However, exploit kits themselves typically distribute malware targeting Microsoft Windows. But to understand exploit kits, we first need to define what is a vulnerability and what is an exploit. Now, vulnerability is an unintended flaw in software code that leaves it open to exploitation in the form of unauthorized access or malicious behavior. If you were to look at an example of a vulnerability, these are cataloged in a common vulnerabilities and exposures database. If we were to look at this particular one, it starts with CVE and the year 2016 and the a one up serialization of uh, numbers of vulnerabilities for that year. In this particular vulnerability, Adobe Flash Player 21.0.0.226 and earlier allows remote attackers to execute arbitrary code via unspecified vectors as exploited in the wild in May 2016. Now this is very interesting. When they say execute arbitrary code, in this case we're talking malware. In this case, especially for this lecture, for this presentation, I should say, we're talking ransomware. And unspecified vectors as exploited in the wild would be through exploit kits. The vulnerabilities that exploit kits target, the big one is flash player. Flash player is probably the number one vulnerability that I've seen exploit kits continually target. Next up on the list would be browsers, and usually we're talking Internet Explorer. I know there have been browser uh, for Chrome or Firefox that uh, I've heard that exploit kits have used in the past, but that requires 
building a new exploit for each particular browser. So Internet Explorer still is the, as far as Windows computers anyway, uh, uh, pretty much has a, the number one market share, so to speak. So that's the most common browser, and that's the, uh, definitely the most targeted. To a lesser extent, I've seen Silverlight exploits, although I haven't seen much of Silverlight lately. And then Java and PDF exploits through your web browser plugins. Uh, I have not seen those in a couple of years, although those used to be very, very popular up through about 2013, 2014. The difference between a vulnerability and an exploit is an exploit is a file or a piece of code that takes advantage of a vulnerability in an application. It's the exploit that allows the criminals to install the ransomware on your machine behind the scenes if you're using an exploit kit. The exploit itself is not malicious. The exploit has to be used within a particular framework. And that particular framework, in this case, is exploit kits. And as we mentioned earlier, an exploit kit, um, to put it in another way, it's a web server that uses exploits to take advantage of vulnerabilities in browser-based applications to affect a Windows computer, a laptop, or a desktop without the user's knowledge. And we're generally talking in clients. We're generally not talking Windows servers. Although I have seen Windows servers get infected when a system administrator logs on to a Windows server, for example, and wants to download a, a particular driver or something for that server, so they'll hop on a web browser on the server and go searching, basically using that server as a client, searching for a particular driver or a particular piece of software or something that they need while they're remotely logged into a server. And that generally is how I've seen Windows servers get infected from exploit kit activity. Now, most exploit kits currently use software as a service or platform as a service for their business model. You don't buy an exploit kit, you rent an exploit kit. Another acronym we've seen for this in recent years has been exploit kits as a service. Not necessarily the acronym, I just put that there, E-K-A-A-S. Uh, definitely we have seen the term exploit kit as a service in the last year or two. If you want to know how much an exploit kit costs to rent, from the Checkpoint blog earlier this year in April, they analyzed an exploit kit that is no longer available, nuclear exploit kit. In that, they say that leading exploit kits are sold in cyber criminal circles for a few thousand dollars a month. Approximately, I want to say August of 2016, the uh, uh, what's called the Neutrino exploit kit uh, had uh, was charging as much as seven thousand dollars a month. If you look at how an exploit kit server works. The user is directed to an exploit kit server's landing page. That landing page will profile the Windows computer, the victim's Windows computer. It will profile it, and then it will select the appropriate exploit. Once it sends the exploit, then the exploit, if it's successful, will send the malware. The malware is the payload. In this case, we're talking ransomware, but it, an exploit kit may distribute something other than ransomware. It's just that in recent months, ransomware has definitely been the most common payload I've seen from exploit kits. You also need to understand actors and campaigns. An actor is what we call a criminal group behind a particular piece of malware. And a campaign is a campaign set up around an exploit kit to utilize the exploit kit properly to distribute malware, or in this case, ransomware. You cannot just rent an exploit kit by itself and expect people to come visit the exploit kit server that's being set up. It has to happen behind the scenes. In order for it to happen behind the scenes, you need a campaign structured around it. In most exploit kit campaigns, legitimate websites are used to kick off a chain of events leading to an infection. 
and malicious web-based advertisements like banner ads are also a common way to start to kick off that chain of events that lead to an exploit kit behind the scenes. If we were to look at a chain of events for a typical exploit kit infection, you have a compromised website. This is, once again, a legitimate website. It could be anything. There are, every day, every day as I'm researching exploit kits, I find countless numbers, countless for me anyway, numbers of websites that are compromised that the owners don't know about. And while the websites themselves are perfectly legitimate and fine, they have code that's injected into them by the criminals behind the scenes that's leading to an exploit kit. Once that exploit kit is successful, it delivers a ransomware. If you have a malicious advertisement, this is going to happen usually through a banner ad. So you have a website, say, like the New York Times. New York Times, New York Times hosts ads to generate revenue. Well, criminals will use that as a way to get in to, uh, uh, to generate an exploit kit uh, chain of events, uh, an infection, to use exploit kits to deliver their ransomware. Next up, we'll look at ransomware history and trends. For the ransomware trends, we're really seeing this as a growing threat over the past few years. At Palo Alto Networks, we've collected over 1 million samples from more than 60 ransomware families so far, and we expect that number to keep growing. Every day we're seeing uh, new file hashes, various uh, uh, updates uh, multiple times a day. The criminals will tweak their ransomware in an effort to avoid antivirus detection. Ransomware is very profitable. Uh, Two families of ransomware, CryptoLocker and CryptoWall, which are no longer active at, at the moment, alone, those two families of ransomware generated at least $45 million based on, uh, for the criminals based on federal reporting. Currently, we're looking at ransomware, uh, the ransom payments averaging from one to three bitcoins, which the last time I checked the exchange rates was about $600 to $1,800. And targeted attacks are seen, but these attacks are largely victim agnostic and not necessarily targeted. Exploit kits are a method of mass distribution of ransomware, of any sort of malware. So they're not necessarily targeted. If somebody doesn't know how ransomware got on their system, odds are it was through an exploit kit. Um, we'll normally see, you'll see a lot of reporting about how hospitals are targeted by ransomware attacks, which is true, but other other organizations, uh, uh, commercial businesses and stuff, they're just as targeted as hospitals, uh, especially uh, uh, state, local, and local governments and educational institutions, they're targeted as well. But the media will take whatever story seems to be uh, the more interesting to, be, to present that to people. Uh, from what we've seen, yes, we've seen targeted attacks, but largely victim agnostic. Anybody could be a target for ransomware. If we're trending ransomware and we look at a timeline, we have to go all the way back to 1989 for what was called AIDS ransomware. This is a time before we actually had the the uh, uh, the term ransomware was popular. The AIDS ransomware was distributed in 1989 uh, using uh, a regular postal mail on floppy disks that provided educational material on AIDS. After a set number of reboots, the victims' files were encrypted, and the ransom was $189 that you had to send to a post office in Panama. We go back again to the timeline, and it was more than 16 years later, approximately 16 years later, that we saw the first wave of modern ransomware. Now, this stuff is, uh, uh, they were almost 
as often as not, it wasn't actual programs, but uh, uh, pop-up windows that would be that would uh, uh, give you messages typical to what we see of ransomware nowadays, where it says your files are encrypted or you cannot access your computer, and you can't get rid of these pop-up windows until you pay the the uh, people behind the that particular wave of ransomware uh, their ransom. So three years later, we had a, a fake antivirus uh, emerged, and I was able to get uh, um, a, a few years later. I've uh, caught a couple of examples that I will share with you. In 2014, I was generating exploit kit activity in my test lab and came across something called the Windows Anti-Breach Module. Basically, your Windows host is going, you're, you're browsing uh, uh, through the web like you would uh, uh, any other time that you're just uh, uh, searching for something on the web. All of a sudden, this window comes up. Shortly after that, another window comes up, and it looks like it's scanning your computer for viruses or malware or whatever. You see various pop-up windows that uh, uh, in this case popped up on the lower right hand corner of the screen it would take information uh, from IP addresses that you were actually visiting in network traffic and come up with fake messages like this IP address is trying to target your bank account credentials in this case in 2014 this particular host I was uh, running in a virtual environment and I had VMware tools installed on it and it would come up and uh, legitimate files legitimate uh, uh, legitimate files on your computer it would come up and say that they were trying to access the internet and trying to do uh, a virus or malware type of activity you can click on the activate button for an example of antivirus fake antivirus and then you would be able to pay using your credit card and pay for different licensing agreements for this fake antivirus. The problem with this is if you were to pay this, you're paying directly to the criminals. And the criminals would then, there is a good chance, that, uh, especially if you're paying directly to the criminals, that they would have your credit card information as well. And they would still have access to your computer. Uh, um, the whole fake antivirus uh, deal as ransomware basically left you open to further exploitation from the criminals. By 2011, we saw locker-style ransomware. And locker-style ransomware would come up and it would show you a screen that would prevent you from even accessing your computer. Here's an example from 2013. Um, I'm in, currently in San Antonio, Texas. And uh, uh, so the messages were tailored uh, towards your particular location based on your IP address. In this case, you have a picture of uh, President Obama in the upper hand, right hand corner looking very, very disappointed at you. And usually you would have a message saying that you have been viewing pornography, which is illegal, which uh, uh, depending on the pornography would not be illegal at all, but it would indicate that you've done some sort of malicious activity. And in this case, you would pay using uh, uh, some sort of uh, money type telegram service like Money Pack or MoneyGram. You could go to uh, Walmart or CVS or some other uh, uh, type of business that has these uh, uh, money wiring services and wire money to the criminals, and you would get your uh, decryption key to be able to unlock your computer. I shouldn't say decryption key, an unlock key to be able to unlock your computer. Here's another one from 2013. This one claims it's from the FBI. And in this particular one, I've blocked out uh, the images because this claim that you're viewing child pornography. And the interesting thing on here is it would claim to have server logs 
that showed that your IP address that your computer was using, your public IP address, had accessed various servers looking at child pornography related material. Of course, it's all a lie in this case. It's just trying to get you to pay the ransomware, or, or I'm sorry, trying to pay the ransom in order to unlock your computer. By 2013, we saw a family ransomware called CryptoLocker. CryptoLocker was discovered in late 2013. It was distributed mainly through attachments and emails, although I had seen it through exploit kits. It was the first highly effective ransomware that corrected many flaws in previous ransomware. CryptoLocker is probably the first time that uh, a lot of people had heard of ransomware. And this is when we started seeing Bitcoins used for ransom payment. And the ransom payment itself was generally one Bitcoin or at the time about $400. This family ransomware was, uh, was killed uh, during the takedown of uh, the Zeus botnet in 2014. So it had, uh, it had a very short but effective reign as the most effective ransomware at that time. By 2014, we saw one of the successors uh, uh, of, ransomware, of successful ransomware families, which was CryptoWall. CryptoWall was extremely popular from mid-2014 to late 2015. Its sophisticated network back end made it extremely resilient. This is when you first started seeing Tor, uh, um, Tor addresses being used to contact the criminals uh, by people that had their computers infected. So they would use Tor for personalized payment pages, and you also had to do a CAPTCHA to be able to get to those Tor payment pages. So uh, people analyzing exploit kits and people analyzing malware were not able to rapidly process and uh, uh, find these indicators and be able to shut them down. Crypto Wall went through four major revisions uh, from the regular Crypto Wall to Crypto Wall 2.0, Crypto Wall 3.0, and Crypto Wall 4.0 before it disappeared in, in late 2015 or early 2016. In this case, you'd be browsing, and all of a sudden, this window would pop up, and you would see icons on your desktop that had other formats for the decryption instructions, whether it was an image file, a text file, or an HTM file. Uh, I'm sorry, an HTML file, or a direct link to the instructions. Here's an example with CryptoWall 2.0 of a CAPTCHA page that you would have to enter a code to be able to proceed to the uh, uh, payment instructions. And once you got to the payment instructions, it would generally demand one Bitcoin. In that case, I believe it was around $500, US uh, dollars. And then it would increase the payment if you didn't pay within a certain amount of time. Now, as far as ransomware is concerned, Windows are not the only platform that is targeted by ransomware. We have KeyRanger. KeyRanger was one of the first discovered ransomware examples for Apple's OSX OSX platform. Now, this is MacBooks uh, that we're talking about, or uh, the actual Mac desktops or Mac minis or what have you, anything that was running a, a Mac. The criminals backdoored a popular BitTorrent client for, for OS X in early 2016. It was called Transmission. Trans, this Transmission BitTorrent client, they somehow compromised that, that uh, um, website, were able to take the Transmission program, be able to update it without the authors of the Transmission BitTorrent program knowing about it. So for a period, I want to say it was about 24 hours, and Palo Alto Networks uh, has published a blog on Key Ranger, and our company worked with the Palo Alto Networks worked with the uh, uh, 
with the people behind transmission and other uh, uh, other agencies to be able to shut this down within a relatively short amount of time. But KeyRanger, when it was out there, it attempted to encrypt about 300 types of files after 72 hours when you in installed a version of this transmission BitTorrent client that had been compromised by the people behind uh, the KeyRanger ransomware. When we're talking about clients, which is what we've been talking about uh, um, through this presentation up to this point, we're ignoring servers, but servers are a much more lucrative target for the criminals because usually the people that are behind servers are willing to pay much more money to get their information back uh, uh, online. So we have what is called the SAMHSA group, and they they were using ransomware targeting it, uh, web servers in late 2015, and they leveraged unpatched instances of JBoss, which is a uh, application platform that's uh, popular with uh, Red Hat and other Linux operating systems. They were able to use uh, vulnerabilities in web servers that did not have their JBoss uh, installations up to date. They were able to access the server, and then once they got on the server, they dropped their ransomware. It encrypted everything, and then you saw your message. And in this case, the ransom averaged around 45 bitcoins, which at the time was about $20,000. We, uh, from what we understand, 30 to 40 samples have been discovered, and it looks like the healthcare industry was primarily affected based on what we've been able to find out. If we're to look at uh, the typical exploit kit payloads that I see on a near daily basis, the first one is Locky. Locky is a family of ransomware that has been around for at least a, a couple, uh, one or two years now, and it's gone through a few revisions. If you were currently infected by Locky through an exploit kit, you would find that your files were have all been renamed a string of characters, and then the file extension would be .odin. What you see right there is an example of the sample pictures of an infected host. So nowhere in those file names is, is the name of the original file. Another popular one that we've seen starting this month, starting in October of 2016, is Kerber Ransomware. Kerber Ransomware is pretty interesting because when your computer is infected, it will pop up a window and you'll hear audio saying, attention, 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 your files have been encrypted or uh, some sort of message. And it will use uh, uh, my, uh, Microsoft Visual uh, Basic to generate the, uh, um, the, the, the audio warning. Another interesting thing about Kerber Ransomware is it's uh, changed the type of CAPTCHA uh, to further make it harder for uh, uh, people to automatically process the malware and uh, uh, get to the payment page. In this case, the uh, uh, you've got a three by three grid of pictures and you click on the picture of, uh, I'm assuming it's a uh, boy as opposed to a girl, the girl has a longer hair. Click on the boy, click verify, and a few less uh, uh, panels of that boy face will come up and you keep clicking and verifying and clicking and verifying until uh, there are no more boy faces. It's the first time I've seen that before. Finally, you have Crypt File 2 ransomware. Um, this one is kind of interesting because it includes an email address, enc5 at dr.com, within the encrypted file names. In this case, you'll see tulips.jpg, tulips for example, on the one that I have highlighted there, was the original file name, and it depends everything. You've got an ID number for your uh, that identifies your particular infected host on the net, and then you would, in the decryption instructions, you don't go to a payment page. You basically email the criminal and start corresponding with them through email to get your decryption key. 
If we're to look at infections in the sled vector, in Springfield, Tennessee, City Hall had all of its files encrypted, and they spent four days to recover. They had to wipe their servers and reinstall the data from backups. There was a police station in Melrose, Massachusetts that was infected with ransomware. They paid one Bitcoin to recover their files. That one, I would imagine, was uh, uh, just a regular uh, mass distributed ransomware, not necessarily a targeted attack, my guess. We also saw a county uh, attorney's office in Pinal County, Arizona, had 64,000 files encrypted, and that shut down the office's case management system until they could resolve the issue. And the most recent news reports on that, uh, I did not see that they had solved the issue yet. As of, uh, um, as of the time that I'm giving this presentation right now. Horry County, South Carolina schools were hit with ransomware and forced to shut down more than 100 servers. They had to pay $8,500 for the decryption fee to get their files back. University of Calgary in Canada paid almost twice as much, 16,000 US dollars, to recover data from a ransomware attack. And these are all examples that it happened this year in 2016. If you look at a simple Google search, we'll find many, many other examples from previous years in the SLED vector. If we look at the trends, we can imagine that criminals will not stop, will, will not stop spreading ransomware. It's a very profitable uh, uh, business for the criminals. We've definitely seen an increase in recent years, at least as far as exploit kits and the mass distribution of malware. Uh, uh, most of the criminals, most of the malware that we see is ransomware. Not all of it. I would have to say the majority of it. <laughs> at least 51% or more. Uh, we can expect to see higher ransoms. We can expect to see new infiltration tactics to improve the success rates more actively targeted attacks, and the Internet of Things. Uh, this image that you see in the slide is a uh, uh, Internet-connected thermometer that uh, a smart device that's connected to the Internet and is running some version of Linux. So during DEF CON earlier this year, somebody did a proof of concept how easy it was to be able to find somebody's Internet-connected uh, uh, thermostat, this particular brand, I forget which one it was, and to be able to compromise it, drop some ransomware on it, and then boom, you've got on your thermometer, if this were to actually happen to you in your home, uh, you would have a message saying, you can't access your thermometer anymore, you need to pay us a Bitcoin to get control back. So next up, we'll look at your best defense. The number one defense against exploit kits is to patch or update your Windows hosts. If you're running, uh, you know, heaven forbid you're running Windows XP because that's currently not patched anymore. Uh, my advice would be to run Windows 10. It's currently the most robust operating system as far as defending against exploit kits. I have a much, much harder time infecting a Windows 10 host through an exploit kit than I do, say, a Windows 7 host. The problem that we see with a lot of organizations is uh, they'll have specialized software that requires an older version of the operating system or an older version, for example, of Flash or Java or something where it literally requires an out-of-date application or an out-of-date uh, uh, Windows version. And that is just opening yourself up to a, a possibility of an attack through an exploit kit. You can also block Tor or other anonymous networks if possible. Uh, you need to keep regular backups of important data and test them. Most importantly, you need to test them. The thing here is you can keep regular backups of data, but if you don't test them and make sure that you're able to recover them in a timely manner, uh, they're, they're they're not much uh, they're they're not as worth it to you. They're not as an effective an effective solution against ransomware and exploit kits. And uh, you should also stay aware of new malware, new types of ransomware that are out there, and certain indicators 
of that ransomware. Implementing browser restrictions, uh, for example, uh, um, if people are not already doing this, pornography websites are a popular source of compromised websites that generally lead to exploit activity. If you implement browsing restrictions to questionable websites like pornography or gambling or what have you, you can cut down on the number of instances that you would see exploit kit activity. You can implement policy restrictions that prevent ransomware once it's sent to your system from an exploit kit from actually executing. So there are certain uh, directories and locations under Microsoft Windows that exploit kits will tend to drop the malware and execute it. If you have a, a policy restriction uh, uh, implemented on your Windows host that prevents that from that malware from executing, you prevent a ransomware infection. And finally, a threat detection prevention and protection solution. Uh, uh, Palo Alto Networks, my employer, is one of many security vendors that could help you in that area. And that pretty much concludes the presentation. I want to thank you guys for having me speak here. And uh, uh, this is uh, this has been a this has been great fun. I've enjoyed talking with you. And this is the official start of the question and answer session. I'm looking at the questions from the audience uh, in the chat. Uh, two questions not really related to uh, ransomware or exploit kits. Uh, one says, would reloading your website every 24 hours help protect your customers? And I'm not sure uh, where that's coming from, uh, ransomware, in that uh, um, it, it, to protect yourself against ransomware, you have to make sure that uh, uh, you're following the uh, best practices uh, mentioned earlier, make sure your machines are patched and up to date. The other one is a question about Friday's uh, Internet of Things uh, DDoS attack, uh, which is completely unrelated to the topic of this lecture. It does mention Windows 10, uh, which is something uh, um, when you're talking about making sure that your operating system is patched and up to date, Windows 10 is a much better operating system to use than, say, Windows 7 or any of the earlier versions as far as vulnerabilities that could somehow uh, uh, let uh, attackers or let uh, the mass distribution of ransomware get through. I see a question that says, what what tool or tools can a small organization use to block Tor? Uh, that is a very good question. It, um, and off the top of my head, I, uh, I, I really couldn't tell you. Uh, most of the Tor traffic is uh, uh, set up to, uh, when you're talking about any sort of a, a firewall, it, uh, it's set to look just like uh, regular uh, encrypted web traffic, HTTPS traffic that you would see. And so I do, unfortunately, I do not have a uh, particular a, an answer to that particular question off the top of my head. What I will say is um, for bigger organizations, uh, uh, usually that have more of a budget uh, uh, to set up, uh, even then, uh, in the few that I personally had experience with, uh, tour traffic is something, that, uh, 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 something that's uh, generally hard to block. Another thing that I'll uh, mention is an emphasis on user education. Uh, the vast, vast majority of ransomware uh, that I see uh, uh, is generally from uh, email that somehow makes it through the systems. Uh, 
and uh, usually these emails are to the experienced eye can uh, generally spot these. I see another question that just popped up, a follow-on question about the Internet of Things. Does that environment lend itself to a ransomware attack? My answer would be no more than any other environment. Um, every environment, any network environment has uh, um, a, a face or a, 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 a public-facing portal, if you will, uh, that vulnerabilities can be exploited. However, um, the Internet of Things environment doesn't lend itself to ransomware attacks as much as the primarily targeted platform, which is Windows. See another question? Ask, would installing a host-based IPS or IDS assist with protecting the system from ransomware? Um, by uh, that's a good question. And when you're talking about the uh, host-based, uh, most of the host-based uh, or endpoint protection, uh, the solutions I see are generally antivirus. And ransomware, just like uh, most of the other malware out there, is generally updated so frequently that uh, antivirus's uh, uh, solutions, uh, endpoint solutions, are not quite as effective. There are certain types of solutions that uh, uh, act on uh, more on behavior or heuristics, and that generally tends to work a lot better. Let's see another one that says Palo Alto Dynamic Block Lists, Emerging Threats, has a list of Tor exit nodes that can be blocked. Uh, that is correct. Um, thank you. Thank you for mentioning that. If ransomware can be activated via web browser activity is the next question. How does a vendor prevent this from happening to their customers? Um, it, it generally is through uh, uh, it generally is through blocking uh, uh, domains and IP addresses uh, known and associated with the activity. However, those generally change uh, tend to change. Um, other things when you get uh, uh, past a, uh, a strict only network uh, uh, issue is you're looking at uh, um, traffic patterns, uh, reputational lists. That generally is how I've seen uh, 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 security vendors uh, prevent that sort of thing from happening to their customers. And what I will say is uh, I have yet to see a solution that is 100% effective. Uh, um, which is uh, which is really bad for the people uh, uh, who have any particular vendor or security system because it doesn't mean that that system or vendor is bad. It just means that it, uh, uh, just with this cat and mouse game that we are playing, uh, you know, between the ransomware authors and uh, the people defending against them, uh, um, I haven't seen a situation yet where uh, any. The security solution provider has been 100% ahead of the game. But I will say there are different uh, there are differences in the way various vendors approach the problem. Uh, uh, Palo Alto Networks, for example, has their own. Uh, uh, our own, I should say, uh, uh, at Palo Alto Networks, we have our own particular method of trying to combat uh, this stuff, which is, you know, once again, I, I can never say it's 100%, but uh, I can say it's uh, uh, some of the best that I've seen uh, amongst the solutions that I personally have experience with. One of the interesting things I didn't get into in depth here in this particular presentation is exploit kits itself, because exploit kits are rather um, it's a rather complex concept uh, to fully explain and get people to understand the various uh, uh, details and nuances of how exploit kits exactly work. Um, understanding the threat is uh, uh, a very uh, uh, very hard to do in many cases because it's never that simple or straightforward. 
the criminals uh, uh, behind ransomware, behind any sort of malware, are always looking for new ways to get in and are always uh, trying to, to tweak and adjust their processes and their procedures in order to be able to infect people. And um, in the case of ransomware, you know, start getting those ransom payments. Another thing I will see, or I will say, is uh, there have been since I've started working in this uh, in this field in this line of work, uh, there have been cases where people have gotten infected with ransomware and they have no idea how the 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 malware got into their system. And generally, it's it's that I've seen in those specific cases where they have no idea. Uh, it generally, is exploit kits and uh, uh, some application on their computer, web-based application is out of date. And without any further questions uh, from the audience, I will uh, uh, go ahead and end this presentation at this time. Uh, thank you all for listening, um, and uh, hopefully we'll uh, we'll catch you guys around. Thanks.